turning that fan off. I was going to be fighting the papers. Yeah. Well, there's not. A, it's cooler outside, and there's not as many of us today. I'm waiting for the uh, video stream to crash, or whatever it's doing. Okay, it says it says that we are connected. I really should cut these parts of the video off later. Uh, the videos are available on YouTube and on Facebook, and Facebook doesn't take them down. And uh, anyway, but uh, if you decide, or actually even audio from the ch uh, church website. So I want to mention uh, one announcement I forgot to make is there's a church uh, harbor fellowship uh, on the QEW right around the uh, St. Catharines on South Service Road, kind of across the area from the Beacon Motor Inn, I think. You can see it on your right. It's a fairly good-sized facility. They are having a worship service this evening, I think around 7. Uh, I, ask me after church, because I have it on the, on the website, but I didn't get it on the announcement sheet. It's an outdoor service, so bring your lawn chair, and uh, if you wish to fellowship there. Uh, Zeke, uh, my grandson, will be, I think, playing, leading worship. Is that right? It's, but it's Sunday. Is not he's gonna do it on, mon on a Monday night? Don't go anywhere tonight. <laughs> it seems like an odd night. Maybe the date's off. I mean, okay. Well, did he tell you that yesterday? <laughs> okay. You say not now. I'm not. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, there's a mystery. Okay, uh, find your Bibles, find a Bible, look it up, and take a look at Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7. And please stay with me. There's a lot of names in here, and I will try to clarify what's going on. Because when you read through the scriptures and you haven't checked what's going on, you think, well, there's just a whole bunch of names. When I see those, I'll go bleep. Uh, that doesn't really help. So I will read it first, and then I will unpack this. And I think you'll be surprised a little bit about how God acts in this situation and what he has done. So Acts chapter 7, Acts, Isaiah 7. In the day of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezim, the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said, Go, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jasub, your son, Shir Jasub, okay, that is the name, your son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, the son of uh, Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria and Eph with Ephraim, the son of, because of Syria, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, "Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it." Thus says the Lord God, "It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin." And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Romalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Shehol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. 
For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted, and the Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Now, I have to, I have to admit I spent two weeks trying to decide when to stop this sermon and break it down into something simple. So I'm going to tell you a story. Now, most of you know I'm from the U.S. And in our history is a big deal, uh, the Civil War, the North and the South. Okay, you know the North and South. And the South were the rebels, considered the rebels, and the North were Yankees. So I'd be raised in Yankee territory. Now, in Israel, remember we read 1 Samuel, and it was about David being anointed king. God promised David that there would always be, his line would be forever. His line would not end. Now, that's an important thing to get. Because you come through time, you have David, and then you have Solomon, his son. And Solomon was a, a tax and spend person. He built great things, but he really wore the people out. And he also wore out God's patience. Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, when Solomon died, asked the advisors, and said, what should we do? What do we do now that Solomon is, is dead? Uh, and, you know, how should, we, how should we carry on with the people? And the old men who were advising him said, your father was hard on the people. Your father taxed them a lot. And you really should back off. But then Rehoboam asked the younger buddies of his in the court and said, what should we do? And he, he said, here's how you should answer the people who are asking, because Jeroboam is already, a man named Jeroboam is already asking for relief. And he said, well, my father beat you with whips. I will beat you with scorpions. You think my father was tough? I'm going to show you who's boss. Jeroboam gathered up the people and went to the north and the north separated from Judah and Bethlehem, and uh, Judah and Benjamin. Now, picture this. Now, I said in the south, you had the rebels. This is the north being the rebels. These are the ten tribes. And they, they separated, and there was a civil war between the north and the south. Judah, with Bethlehem, a small tribe, and most of the Levites, that was a province that included areas like Bethlehem, uh, Jericho, Bethsaida, Bethesda, various places around the city of Jerusalem. It was not just the city. It was that whole area. They stayed uh, in the covenant. The northern tribes, immediately, they built altars in Samaria and then in Damascus in the north. Yes, that Damascus, same place as today. They built altars and idols so that the people would not go back to Jerusalem to worship. Because remember, every, every Jew is to go back and worship in Jerusalem. Well, we can't have that. We're having a civil war right now. Now, if you go through uh, the Old Testament in Kings and Chronicles, you'll find that every king of the Old Testament, of uh, what's called Israel, what king of the north? Every king is an evil king and an idolater. And in the south, it's like, well, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, then he did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. It got worse and worse. But the northern kingdom was terrible to begin with. Now that matters. Now that word, Ephraim, this is where it gets confusing people. When I talk about Israel, when you're talking about Israel now in this place, you're talking about the northern tribes. You're not talking about Judah. But in the Old Testament, sometimes Israel means everybody. But here now we're saying Israel as a separate country, a.k.a. Ephraim. Okay, thank you. We just need multiple names for everything, right? Okay, I mean... Yeah, so what do you call it? What is it, Britain or the UK? I, you know, it's that kind of thing. So you have that northern group, and they are off and on at war. Sometimes they have allies with, with uh, Judah, and sometimes they're at war with Judah. Now, that explains and where we're coming to this passage. Uzziah was a good king, reigned 52 years, and he died. Jotham, his son, was a good king. Isaiah doesn't address him, about 16 years. And then with the co-regency, we get this guy, Ahaz. Ahaz was wicked enough that he sacrificed his own son as a human sacrifice. We're not talking about a good guy here. And after, after Ahaz, you get 
Hezekiah, who's a good king. See, why did God not just tell Ahaz, uh, the lightning bolt's coming for you today. I'm just going to take you out and get rid of you. Because God made a promise to David. And through this line of good and evil is going to come the Messiah. But besides that, Ahaz is not a complete lost cause until today. And he makes himself a lost cause. What's going on? He, there's, been, there's been raiding parties. Uh, you're looking at various kingdoms, like uh, the Syrians, and you're looking at, uh, at Pika, the son of Ramalia, who is so disgusting that Isaiah doesn't mention his name again, just calls him the son of Ramallah. And uh, they come up to, against Jerusalem to wage war. Now, what's this, what this means, and I want, this, I want you to grab onto this part, Ahaz and the house of David says in verse in verse two was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Okay, if Ephraim's coming after me, Israel, we can handle that. If Syria's coming after me, maybe we can handle that. If they're both coming after me, we're doomed. Now I want you to grasp for a moment the kind of fear that is a gut punch fear and your knees go wobbly. It's that kind of fear. He is in a very desperate situation as a king because they often killed kings. In fact, he was taken captive and released later, but he was also killed in a battle later on. And so Ahaz is saying, all right, all right, we got a big problem. And so the Lord, he's, he's terrified. This is pure terror. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashub, your son. Probably a small boy at this time. And look where Ahaz is to be found. He says, Go find him on the conduit, the upper pool, on the highway of the washer's field. Now, they haven't mounted an attack yet, but they're coming. And it's obvious that they start, what they do, these, these raids on kingdoms start not just by throwing up a defense around a siege around Jerusalem, you got this whole province, and one by one the towns and cities around start to fail. They start getting defeated. And so he's getting word that this is what's coming. So what's he doing as a king? He's going out and making sure they got water. Because see, a siege can last years. And they had to make sure they had a way of getting water. And so this place called the Washers, uh, the washers Field. And now, what does is, what is God say? What does God say to this man? He says, be quiet. Be careful. Be quiet. Do not fear. And do not let your heart faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. The fierce anger of Rezin of Syria and the son of Ramalia. Now see, what we're seeing is a warning. You're the king of is you're the king, the rightful king of all Israel, but you're the king of Judah. You're in the line. God is honoring that line, and God says, do not fear. It's just an echo in here that I hear of what Jesus says before he's crucified. What does he say? He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. See, he's giving a challenge right here. He says, you've got to believe. You've got to believe, and, and, and all the things that you do when you're panicking, he says, you don't do those things. You know, be quiet. He says, uh, just settle down, and don't let your heart be troubled. Do not fear. And he calls these things, they're basically two burned out cigarette butts, is what he's calling the enemy. You know, these guys, this guy's afraid of these people. He's afraid of what's coming, and he, I mean, his military people are no doubt telling him, no, they're, they're pretty serious, you take you should take them seriously. And he's saying, Isaiah is saying, no, don't do that. Don't panic. And he says, just because they've said they're going to do these things, look at the promise of God. Verse 7. He says, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is risen. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. Now that's already started, the clock's already started, because within 11 years, within 11 years, Ephraim was taken away. You've heard of the 10 lost tribes? Mm -hmm. They're still lost. They're gone. 
the, 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 the uh, Assyrians took them away. It's ironic how that actually happened. But they were, he was so afraid of this enemy. And he says, this is going to go away. And he says the head, of, uh, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. All this head of and that sort of thing is, you're looking, he says, you have a weak army guided and led by another weak army. It says weakness after weakness after weakness. They are nothing to God. And he says something we need to grasp in a time of fear. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. What was Ahaz doing? He was strategizing. He was doing all the strategic things you got to do. Now, I know when we're in a situation, we frequently, we, we do plan, and there's no sin against planning. But what he is making, the point he's making is, Ahaz is going to be, you'll see a choice being made here. Ahaz has a choice in trusting God or trusting his plans. And we'll see what Ahaz, Ahaz does. He says, if you're not firm in faith, whatever doesn't proceed out of faith is sin. You know, for our moving through troubled times, it has to be a faith that is committed and owning and belonging to Christ. Now, what happens? What happens when you've got wonderful plans and you're not so sure you want God involved in them. Okay? What is it when you've got, you got, okay, I've got, I can do this. I can defeat. In fact, actually, Ahaz has a plan, which is hilarious on the face of it, and tragic. And we'll see the tragedy in a minute. But what is it? When C.S. Lewis said that when a man becomes a Christian, it's like having a run-down house, and you bring in a handyman, and he starts correcting walls fixing windows, doors, and things like that. And we're all very happy to have the really bad things done. But then he starts opening closets and going down hallways and looking into rooms that we, we didn't invite Jesus into those rooms. I've got stuff in there that, you know, just stay out of that, right? That's my business. And, of course, you don't invite Jesus into your life. You don't think God's going to come into your life and just only touch the stuff you think you've got a problem with. And Ahaz has got a big problem in his refusal to believe in God. And here it comes. You look at verse 10. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz through the prophet, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now normally God doesn't say, ask for a sign. In fact, you're not to tempt the Lord your God and ask for signs. But when God says, I want you to believe in me, and I want you to ask for a sign, and it could be, well, it, won't, it, would, it would not have been what, he, what happened, because God gave him a sign anyway. But what happens? He says, ask for the sign. And it could be, as, it could be from the lowest depths of Sheol, or the highest. He could have asked for the moon to spin around during the day or something. He could have asked for a couple of eclipses. He could have asked for the sun to stop and stand. Anything, he says. Whatever you want, I will give you a sign. Now, Ahaz does what a lot of us do when we don't want God in our lives. We become very, very pious. Oh, no. I would never put the Lord God to the test. Now, who was telling him? It wasn't just his buddy saying, hey, if God's so great, why don't you, you know, why doesn't he put a million dollars in your bank account? You know, get that kind of sign. You know, if God's so, you know, that's not what's happening here. You have a prophet of God. By the way, in chapter 6, the prophet of God was terrified. And now the people he's speaking to are terrified. And he says, okay, you're in a terrible situation. Ask for a sign. God's saying that. And what is, he said, no, no, no. We mustn't, mustn't do that sort of thing. He said, I will not seek. I will not put the Lord, God to, the te- the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. And he's speaking to Ahaz and the people around him. He said, this is speaking to the whole the whole nation here, and he's, uh, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? And notice in verse nine, verse 10, he says, uh, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Isaiah says, cut him off. He says, is it too much that you're going to wear me out? You're going to wear out my God too? He's not saying you're God anymore. Because Ahaz is taking a stand. Ahaz is saying, I will not... See, he's saying, I will not put the Lord God to the test. 
what he's saying is, I will not trust him. I, because what happens? Okay, I want you to, uh, you know, make the sun go down at noon. Okay, it happens. Well, then what happens? Then you got to listen to him. <laughs> but if you don't give me a sign, if I don't ask for a sign, I'm off the hook. Well, actually, he's on a hook more so than he knows. It's actually, this, this whole passage here is about where, is, where Judah gets doomed. It gets much worse. And this is a choice. This is where a leader can take a whole nation away. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You didn't ask for a sign. And this is not a sign that you asked for. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. Now, nowhere in the Bible is anyone named Emmanuel except Christ. So what, what's being said here is you're going to get a sign, all right, and this sign is going to reach beyond you. It's going to reach beyond your nation. It's going to reach beyond your invasion, your Babylonian captivity, and all these things. It's going to reach over 500 years, and there's going to be a sign. But you didn't want to see a sign right now, but you're going to get a sign, and all of history is going to be bent towards that sign. And you're going to... You're going to be part of the, of the evil in the story. And he speaks about how much time is going to go by. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, which simply means it's, he's going to be raised a normal life. And he says, for, the boy, for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Okay, so you asked, you were told to ask for a sign, you didn't take it, so God's going to win anyway. Let's imagine for a moment that you're a mouse. And in your mouse house, in the house here, before you get slaughtered by somebody, you're a mouse and you're doing mousing, but in your house, you are in the same place, same barn, there's two rats. And they said, uh, our exterminator said, you know, if there's... If you have uh, rats, you don't have mice. They don't like each other. And uh, but you okay? You got you're a mouse and you've got friends. So you say, okay, well look, I got two rats harassing me. So I gotta call up a cat. I want the cat to take care of these rats. Oh, okay. So the rat comes. The cat comes in takes care of the rats. Then what's the cat gonna do? I know what I'm gonna do. These bad guys are coming after me. I'm going to call Assyria. And what he says here in this passage is, yeah, you're going to call Assyria. That's your great strategy. You're going to call Assyria. You know what they're going to do? They're going to wipe you out. They're going to attack you. First, they're going to take Ephraim away. And they're going to attack you too. And they're, they're, they're the cat. They're not going to stop with just the rats. They're going to come after you. Now, do you see where our strategies are so dangerous? We can make godly decisions but we need to put our faith first of all in our our fear in faith uh when our fear hits us to come to christ and he says in the last verse of this he says the lord will bring upon you and upon your your people and upon your father's house such days as has not come since that day ephraim departed from judah so remember when I said that Jeroboam and his group took off to the north? That was Ephraim. This, that was a disaster. The next disaster is the one you just asked for. You have asked for the king of Assyria. You're going to get the king of Assyria. Good and hard. Now what does that do for us right now? What is God doing in our place of fear? And I was a little surprised. I, was, I, I, I do read some commentaries. Uh, especially on passages that are a little more difficult. And I was quite pleased when I read Calvin on this, and his commentaries are very short. But he says, you know, many times we are given signs of faith that we refuse from the Lord. And he was dealing with Switzerland at the time. We lived in Geneva. I believe it was, I want to say Zurich, but that's not correct, uh, where there was the Radical Reformation. Radical Reformation was a bunch of people who went, took over a whole city. Uh, some of them ran around naked, uh, sat in bell towers, and had prophecies all day long. This is called the Radical Reformation. Calvin called them, called them fanatics. And there was all kinds of craziness going on until eventually all the surrounding countryside uh, cities said that's enough. They took them out. 
But that movement denied physical truth. And so what were the two things that God gave as signs to strengthen our faith that these, this group eliminated, and it still happens today? What two things can you think of? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's so easy to say, well, those are spiritual realities and those are not real things. And yet the Bible doesn't separate it like that. The Bible doesn't say, well, you were kind of spiritually baptized, but there's no baptism, there's no immersion. And certainly Lord's Supper, this is one of the stress points between Christians uh, in Ontario and, the, and their government. Well, you can do Zoom communion. No, we can't. And we are not, that's not communion. And so we gather together because we have these signs that drive home the point. Your baptism, you're baptized once, and then you remember that. You remember, I've been raised with Christ. I, all the promises of Romans 6, of Colossians chapter 2, all those things. I have been raised with Christ. I'm, I'm seated with Christ. I've been buried with Christ in baptism. What, what fantastic promises. We think about them, we think, that is a sign that we're told to ask for. And every Lord's Day, we are reminded in the Lord's Supper that, he ha that God has given us a sign. And I think the reason Calvin brought it up in the way he did in this passage is because those signs were under attack. And I think, wow, how current can you get than what is happening now in, in uh, Geneva uh, in the 16th century? how people were dismissing that. And then I actually, it's not, it's not a joke. People are doing virtual avatar baptisms. Soak that in a minute. You know, you know how you have these avatars that don't look anything like you? Sorry, I want to tell you, I've never seen one that looks anyone like you. Know. <laughs> Hi, do I look you? No, okay. And you have this avatar, and somehow they manage to, uh, to baptize, or baptize remotely. Like, okay, you get in the water, I'll stand over here and say words, and then you baptize yourself. Because we're, what? Afraid. We are fearful. Now, it makes sense to be afraid of things that are fearful. But it makes more sense to trust God first in the middle of that. I learned to pray in panic when I was a kid. Uh, how to pray when you're in panic is because you have that horrible sound. If you don't have that here. Horrible sound of air raid sirens going off. Horrible sound. And there are two kinds. One was, okay, it's cloudy and it's grimy outside. The wind's starting to blow and you get green clouds and everything like that. Head to the basement and hope you got a house left when you're done. Or the other siren, which is the one they saved during the Cold War for nuclear uh, attack. That was fun because it would be sunny outside and you hear, oh, they made a mistake. They made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> we were across the river from an Air Force base. And so, you know, you hear this siren, sirens going off. You think, ah, oh, there's really nothing to do. But you learn in those moments, even you when know, there's not a lot of time, the tornado gives you a little less time. Uh, you might get half an hour, I guess, from uh, that they're going to nuke us. You see, but you have some time to pray as you're running around trying to find candles and flashlights and all those really important things, see? We have had, we have been immersed, we have been drunk with fear in Ontario. And I, I'm not scolding anyone here for that. I don't see fear on your faces. But I see deep concern for family and for friends who need to be let out of that. And I see, and I know there's fear for an uncertain future for, I don't know, for lack of a better word, for normals, but for people who are not terrified, right? And not following things that are terrifying. We have to remember, and I'll just finish up really quick here, that when we make a plan that has nothing to do with God, we will often get exactly what we plan. And that's a terrible thing. And you know, Ahaz was not unredeemable but he finally said, no, I don't want anything to do with God. He says, okay, well, the sign's going to come centuries from now. But the sign that you, you want <laughs> for yourself, your strategies are going to come true very soon. 
You know, uh, I think it's uh, got a couple of names here. I think Raymond Ortman, Ortland or Kent Hughes, I can't remember which one wrote this. He says, we face a coalition of hostile powers far worse than Syrian, Syria and Ephraim of old. We face an alliance of sin and death and they never go away. And we are no match for them. But at this ultimate level, the baby Jesus fulfills the truest meaning of Emmanuel, God with us. See, Ahaz said, I don't want God with us. And God said, well, you're going to have, there's going to be a, a remnant. There's going to be people left over, and it's going to be God with us. That's why it's so, so interesting. Matthew pulls that out of there. And what does he say? God's with us. And in Ahaz's day, they didn't want that sign. And in Matthew's day, they didn't want that sign either. But God's will will not be stopped. And so if you're in a, in a terrible situation, you're in total fear, it could be sudden panic or it could be that long-term daily dose of adrenaline that slowly kills you, all those things, whatever you're feeling, remember that God has already ordained the day you die. Sparrows outside, they don't die without God knowing it. You're of much value, more value than that. You are safe in God's hands in Christ. Heavenly Father, now we pray that you would give us the joy of knowing that you are with us. You are the King that comes before our plans before our goals even what we consider wise plans lord we pray that you would help us to just follow you and trust you even in days that we cannot sort out we pray this in the name of jesus amen now just so you know say goodbye to these people <laughs>